Okay, thank you very much. Um, nice to, to see some arrivals for our first uh, webinar as OER Research Hub. Uh, so today we're going to be talking particularly about what we're finding out about informal learning. Uh, just before we get going, I'll do some basic housekeeping. So uh, just sort of on the privacy side of things, we are recording this. Um, we uh, do expect to release it openly. So be aware of that, and uh, we can see the chat that is going on. We can open private chats, but as moderators, we get to see the, those elements as well. If there are any technical problems, then um, to be honest, you're probably not here. Uh, but uh, if you, anything comes up, if you could try and look at the support information, and um, I think we'll put that link across into the chat so you can find it along the way. Uh, do feel free. In fact, if you're more free, I encourage you to make any comments in the text chat window as we go along. Uh, so you can type text and we'll be looking at that. We may answer it as we go along. We'll certainly collect up any questions and deal with that as we go into the Q&A at the end. Okay, so uh, I think that's the, the basics. Um, and uh, we'll move on now and uh, just say a little bit about who we are. So. Um, uh, I'm Patrick McAndrew. I'm uh, co-lead with Martin Weller for uh, this project, the OER Research Hub project, and that's a project where we've got backing from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation to look at uh, some of the research issues around the impact that open educational resources find. And we've set up the project to have underlying hypotheses that we're addressing. And one of those is around the overlap between informal and formal education that open education resources address. And we've got two of our researchers with us today. We've got Leanne Perriman, who's a research associate with the Open Education Resources Research Hub. Uh, and Leanne's one of uh, four researchers that we've got directly based here. And Petrina Law, who's carrying out a research project as a, a fellow. Her core job is as head of third party online commissioning here at the Open University having moved across from working directly with us at the Erdman Institute of Educational Technology. And as head of third party, she looks after things like the Open Learn platform, uh, iTunes U, links out to YouTube and Google that the Open University uses. So she's in an ideal position to investigate the Open University's own role in looking at this. OK, so um, I think I now do a poll. All right. No, no, I'm being corrected. Uh, I need to talk, talk about the outcomes of the webinar itself. So um, we're, overall, we're looking at the impact of OER. But this webinar, we're going to talk about the work we're doing, which is on uh, open education resources and informal learning. Now, in a, in a sense, there's a, a lot of, uh, there's an ideal match between people who need to take less formal approaches, not be able to sign up to courses, and what open education resources can achieve. But how is it actually playing out in practice? And is this a rather overlooked area? And then we're really interested in the way in which OER can help uh, institutes cross over from that informal area to formal learning. Um, how it is that people can enter into learning through open education resources. And uh, Leanne and uh, Katrina going to particularly look at this from the perspective of uh, the Open Learn iTunes U and the experience we've got here at the Open University. OK. Now I can do my poll. So um, in order to answer this poll, uh, well, there's various ways in which you can do it. But if, if your view is like my view, underneath your name in the participants list on the left-hand side, you'll see something that's got a little A there. And if you could just go down that, and you, you'll see the key is on the slide being presented. We'd like to know which of these you're closest to. Now, with any bit buckets of things, you're, you're going to fall into different areas. But we've put educator. You're here primarily because you're involved in the education side of things. A learner, you're here because you, you spend your time learning. I know everybody learns, so uh, everybody could see this up there. It's the main area, whether you're on the policy side, admin, manager, support side, or other. And if you're on the other, I wouldn't mind you also sort of putting a little chat, bit in the chat, other colon, and what you are. So if you could just answer that poll, 
and I'll just go and select me. So I've been able to select and search. Okay, so uh, please do. I'll just pause for a minute while that's going on. Okay, I think that captures most people, and as we, as the other sort of really does sort of open up all, all the, uh, the the ways in which people come in from different angles. Project manager for School of Open, uh, I think I know who that is. Yes, Jane. Um, support staff, yes, I think it's really important. So this helps us know who you are. We'll come back to this issue perhaps a bit later, uh, but now I want to move on and hand over to. Uh, Leanne, and uh, I'm going to ask Leanne to give us a little bit of an intro about what do we mean by informal learning, and what, what, how does that fit with OER, what's its match to this context. So over to you, Leanne. Hello, everybody. Um, Patrick, you asked what do we mean in this context about informal learning. Well, I'm not going to pretend that this isn't a contested area. Um, like informal learning theorist Jay Cross, we actually see learning as a continuum from formal to informal. Um, the formal, formal learning is accomplished in classrooms, perhaps is officially scheduled, teaches to a curriculum, and informal learning can actually just happen inadvertently, perhaps through observing or through trial and error. But in the context of the OER research hub research, we see informal learning with OER as some way between the two, in that the learning is generally intentional and often inv involves structured materials, but the um, learning experience itself is self-directed and not formally structured. So that's pretty much how we see informal learning. Thanks, Dan. I mean, coming in on that, um, it's sort of almost defined a bit as a negative in there. Um, but how do you see it in terms of the research and linking it through to OER? Well, um, the relationship between informal learning and OER isn't actually very well researched. And currently, um, research tends to focus on the impact of OER on teachers and learners within formal higher education institutions, with some exceptions, obviously, but um, there's much less about informal learning and OER. And that's one of the reasons why, in the OER Research Hub, we chose to focus on this area. And it's the focus of one of our 11 hypotheses, our 11 core hypotheses. You can see the full 11 on our website, but I have the informal learning hypothesis here. Open education acts as a bridge to formal education and is complementary, not competitive with it. And at this point, I'd like to get you all involved again in expressing your own views on this hypothesis through yet another poll. And for this one, fewer options, just the two. Click yes if you agree with this hypothesis that open education acts as a bridge to formal education. And no if you disagree. And I'll just leave you a little bit of time to do that. And you should be able to access the poll in the same way as before. Well, we've got ticks. And yeah, 11, 11 people agreeing. And no ticks disagreeing at the moment, 12 agreeing. Great, OK. Yep. 82%, 14 people, everybody agreeing. Well, three haven't responded. So interesting to see um, as we take this forward um, if anybody's opinion changes or otherwise. Sorry, oh, yeah, I need to remember to turn my mic on. Uh, okay, thank you very much for that. And uh, as I say, sort of. Well, that could be it. Our research is done. Everybody agrees that open education acts as a bridge to formal education, complementary, not competitive with it. But actually, as uh, I think we all know, uh, it's nuanced. It's uh, uh, we forced you to go on a yes, no, and we've got a group of enthusiasts online. I think. Um, so I, I think from the Anne and Katrina, we're going to get a bit more about uh, how the research is supporting and, in some cases, actually challenging this view. So. Um, over to you, Leanne, and then I think uh, Petrina can come in after you. Okay. 
Okay, um, I'm going to be talking about our research with the Open University's Free Online Resources Repository, OpenLearn. And it was launched in 2006 and hosts hundreds of online courses and videos, and many of these are openly, openly licensed. And since its launch, OpenLearn has received 27 million unique visitors, and it's developed from being a platform hosting units from decommissioned undergraduate and postgraduate courses to one that hosts, that hosts course extracts and a range of other informal materials, and that includes commissioned interactive games, videos, blogs, and podcasts. And together, the course extracts and the informal learning materials are visited by over 5 million people a year. And I'm just showing the home page of the OpenLearn site here. Now, the development of OpenLearn was initially funded by the Hewlett Foundation in 2006. And when that funding ended, OpenLearn became a mainstream activity for the OU. And the OU it aims to draw 5% from each of its courses to be made available as open content in whole units. And some of these are embellished with interactive quizzes and audio visual content additionally. And, the, and Open and Learn also hosts bespoke content produced as a result of the OU's partnership with the BBC. And this is actually the content that receives most of the traffic as people are directed there after BBC programs. So that's often the entry point for Open Learn. So for our research on informal learners' use of Open Learn, we conducted an online survey. And this was promoted via web links that were embedded within the areas of the Open Learn site that host course content, and that was in order to increase the likelihood of re reaching informal and formal learners using the site to study whole units or courses rather than just dipping in for information or to look at short videos and editorial content on the home page. So we wanted people who had had extended experience of Open Learn. And the data uh, reported here, they were collected three months after the survey was launched, and at that point there had been 1,067 respondents. Now, the, um, the slide here shows some of the demographic information about the respondents, and it gives us a bit of an insight into the typical user base of OpenLearn 2. For example, the majority of survey respondents were aged between 25 and 64, and there was a 58%, 41%, 1% female, male, and transgender gender distribution. 19% of respondents declared a disability, and this graph shows that many OpenLearn users completing the survey are well-educated, highly qualified um, people, um, in, and our results also showed they're in full-term employment. But it's interesting also that there's a peak of 16% are school-leaving age as well. Um, 16% of respondents indicated that they are educators, 6% that they're full-time students, or 8% that they're full-time students, 6% that they're part-time students, and 87% indicated that they're not currently involved in any formal study, so they can be seen as purely informal learners. So that's um, a bit about open learn. I'll hand over to Petrina now, who can tell you about the research she has been doing. Petrina. Thank you. Um, the open content that's produced by the Open University is released over multiple platforms, as I'm sure many of you know. Whilst we have good statistical information about numbers of visitors to these platforms, we actually know very little about people's motivations for choosing subject matter or how they use the content which, accompanied with the hypotheses of the OER Research Hub project, is partly why we undertook this study. We wanted to know more about them. Since the launch of the iTunes U platform in 2007, educational institutions have exploited it as an additional channel to provide free educational content, and the OU effectively joined the party in 2008. Since then, it has had 63.7 million downloads and 8.6 million visitors, so it's, been, um, it's had a huge success in that respect. So for this study, we put links to our survey in all of the OU's 79 courses on iTunes U. You may be aware that you can have collections of audio and video. There are iBooks and eBooks as well. But we put these in the courses. The aim was to reach users who are engaging with entire courses as opposed to those downloading a single video or an audio file. By the spring of this year, there were 2.5 
about two and a half million total course subscriptions to OU content of the iTunes U. So we were hopeful that we would get a good response rate. Not surprised me to our survey. The next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so if we look at this, which is a direct comparison with the slide that Leanne just previously showed for OpenLearn. Overall, the iTunes users are young. We can be sure that around about 40 to 50% are between 25 and 44 years old. They're mostly male, big majority, about 65% are male. The majority are employed. And of the three platforms, this group contains the lowest number of disabled users, which is 13%. We measure disability as part of our commitment to reporting on widening participation and access. So the graph you can see shows the number, of, the number of formal students, informal learners and educators who responded to our survey on the left there. So we have the majority group is in the informal learning group. Um, you could argue that there's less of a drive to formal learning for the iTunes group because it shows that the group are overall very well educated. And the number of respondents who were under the age of 18 was 7%, which roughly equates to the number who said they had no formal qualification. So those who are adults are well educated who are using the channel. Moving on to YouTube, the OU has also got a channel on YouTube where it hosts audio and visual content created as a result of course unit production. And the university has a commitment to producing or releasing 5% of its course unit production as open content. And so the audio visual pieces end up on iTunes and on YouTube. It also contains bespoke pieces commissioned for the channel specifically that are also shared with iTunes U. So by the spring of this year, the OU had posted over 1,500 videos that have been viewed by 5.7 million people. Again, it had a, a massive impact particularly on our brand awareness, I think. There are 36,500 subscribers to our YouTube content, and 86% of these views are from people outside the UK, interestingly. So if we look at the graph that illustrates the demographics with respect to people's educational qualification again, if we look um, well, we, at the actual number who responded, it's much lower. We've only got 233 respondents, and the reason for this is that there are a distinct lack of opportunities, or at the time that we posted the survey at least, at putting a hyperlink into any text accompanying a YouTube video. So those who participated in the survey literally had to cut and paste a URL to do the, the survey. So overall, the YouTube users are the youngest group. They have equal numbers declaring they are employed and or studying. And they also have a similar percentage of disabled users to OpenLearn, which was around 19%, which is pretty high. They're also mostly male. So again, the graph shows that the number of formal students, informal learners, and educators who responded to our survey, we can see a resounding 60% of them are already students. It shows us that the group overall are less well-educated than the iTunes U group, in part because they're a much younger demographic. In fact, 40% were under 24. As with iTunes, the number who said they had no formal qualification shown in the graph also roughly equates to those who are under 18. So again, we're looking at a group of adults, um, of the group of adults are, are educating themselves currently or are already well educated. Thanks, uh, Kathleen Ann and uh, Trina, for that introduction. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting things already coming up. Uh, so there is this sort of way in which formal learning, informal learning can overlap, and the questions about that. And so I, I think if we sort of look first back at um, open learn uh, so we'll carry on sort of looking at the, the issues and then come back to some of these questions more detail so if, if that's in what you're saying Leanne you can pick up on this link to formal and informal and uh, so what were your findings about the way in which OER acts as, as that bridge to bring it to, to formal learning well, um, we found that OpenLearn was acting as a bridge between informal and formal learning in three main ways. And I'll discuss these in, a, in detail later, but for now, I'll just um, go over the three of them. Firstly, there was evidence that OpenLearn is working as a showcase for the OU's provision and attracting new students, both for the OU and to higher education in general, and promoting the OU's profile. Secondly, we also found evidence that OpenLearn is working as a bridge between informal and formal learning in offering a taster 
of the OU's paid for courses. And this is both to new and to existing students, interestingly, and I'll explore that in a bit more depth later. Finally, we found evidence that Open Learn is helping informal learners and existing formal students to develop and improve their study skills and to accelerate learning. And again, this shows that um, Open Learn is acting as a bridge between informal and formal learning and indicating that OER can be complementary rather than competitive with formal education to return back to our um, research hypothesis around informal learning. Um, I've included a couple of links here because the showcase and the taster arguments for institutional development and sharing of OER are covered in some detail in the 2007 Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development report into the impact of OER. That's pretty, uh, it was a pretty influential report. And more recently, um, the showcase and taster arguments have been addressed by Paul Stacey in his um, extended discussion of OER business models. And that also covered the argument that OER can accelerate learning. And um, I'll discuss the evidence that we found in support of these claims a bit later. But for now, I've included the links to the OECD report and the pertinent blog post by um, Paul Stacey. Just come, come in. Um, so, and you've got sort of people using this, and so uh, you know, you sort of say as a showcase. Um, and actually, one of the people in Jane has raised the issue of sort of awareness of the actual openness in this, and in looking at things. So are people coming in? How are people using this as, as as a showcase? Is it a showcase for people as learners, people as educators? What are you finding in that area? Okay, um, well, we gather both quantitative and qualitative evidence um, around this claim that Open Learn is acting as a showcase for the Open University. And the focus is really on um, learners um, rather than educators in this context, although the two aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, with some of the educators were also formal students as well, say, amongst our respondents. Um, so amongst this evidence, a number of the survey respondents explicitly, explicitly mentioned that using OpenLearn had led to their studying with the OU or their friends doing so. And that's shown in the comments here are, are typical. Um, I recommend OpenLearn to a colleague who was thinking of doing an OU course on retirement. And I've shared contacts with friends and family, some of whom went on to serious OU study. So the link between the OU and OpenLearn is explicit here. Um, Based on the quantitative um, survey results, at first glance, the quantitative data might suggest that open learning is competitive with formal education in that 85% of survey respondents said they were more likely to take a further free course or study further open educational resources after using open learn. So um, that could indicate that there's a competitive relationship. But in actual fact, the second um, figure here, only 12% of survey respondents actually indicated that they were less likely to take a paid for course after using OpenLearn. So the relationship is actually a lot more nuanced and it's important to remember that the two categories aren't mutually exclusive again. It's possible to study um, free resources alongside paid for. So uh, moving on to the formal students who were using OpenLearn, 48% um, of those formal students and 35% of the informal learners who completed the survey did indicate that they were now more likely to take a paid for course after using OpenLearn. So that is indicative that it's a complementary relationship and a bridge to formal learning. And a final consideration in respect of the showcase argument is the fact that 53% of all the survey respondents have suggested that when choosing OER and other free content, their selection of resources is influenced by the resource being created by a reputable and trusted institutional person. So following up from what Katrina had said about the brand, it's indicative that um, brand awareness is, is gained through um, the OpenLearn platform. Uh, so I'm going to follow up on your, your link there into Petrina's um, look at iTunes U and YouTube. So um, is there a difference? And uh, uh, I think sort of obliquely this sort of comes out of that openness. So on the whole, open learn is pretty clear about its openness. I'm not so sure about iTunes U and YouTube. What are your findings in the same area, Petrina? 
Well, we can see from this graph roughly similar results, but I'll break this down a bit. I've used Leanne's data from the Openland study and created a comparison, as you can see, with iTunes U and YouTube respondents who were asked the same question. Understanding the three platforms' demographics will help to explain the differences in preference. For example, the group who are less likely to, pay, to take a paid-for course are the iTunes U users, who are already well-educated. OpenLearn respondents show the highest preference for wanting more content, whether free or paid for. They're very loyal learners, as we know. Uh, they come back to the platform time and time again and don't necessarily move on to take OU courses. The final bars of the chart are interesting, though, if we look on the far right, and encouraging as well for the OU in that they show a good proportion of users strongly agreeing that they have confidence in the factual accuracy of the content being provided. Even though 86% of the iTunes U users are outside of the UK and hence probably don't necessarily have a brand awareness of the OU, we can attribute this confidence either to some of them having this international brand recognition or possibly even that they just have confidence in the iTunes U platform itself. Okay, um, so you said showcase. Taste is the next category. I've got to come in and say uh, I'm not that keen on taste as a label because I think that one of the power of, of open education resources is they actually deliver something in themselves. But nonetheless, um, sort of encouraging people to experience and, and get an interest in uh, what you can do next does seem one of the powers of having opened up for educational res resources. Um, so I'm going to lead you through to perhaps looking at the next question, sort of the showcase version versus well, I'll accept for the moment to call Taster, but I'll say I think I think it's giving more than that when you've got own educational resources. Okay, and um, that's that's a that's a, a good point that we are um, do offer absolutely more than just being a taster, but um, just staying focused on the the taster label at the moment and returning to open learn. Um, there was evidence from the survey that OpenLearn was working as a taster for both um, students new to higher education study and for existing formal students. Now, I'll just unpick that a little here. 42% um, of all the survey respondents indicated that they had used OpenLearn at some point to try out university level content before signing up for a paid for course. So just test, testing out the, um, the study level of higher education. Um, of the formal students who had responded to the survey, 26% um, indicated that OpenLearn had directly influenced their decision to register for their current paid-for course. And a slightly smaller number of the formal students had said that they had studied the specific subject they were currently um, studying in their paid-for course through OpenLearn resources prior to registering on their paid-for course. Um, these two comments give a flavor of typical comments. Um, I've used OpenLearn to try things out before signing up for a module. module. And again, it, the, the word taste is used here. You have the ability to taste areas of the modules before signing yourself up for something which may or may not be suited to you. And a bold statement, all OU modules should have content on OpenLearn. And this idea of try before you by, it's worth um, considering in the context of the um, current funding climate of higher education in England. Uh, quite a, a lot of the survey respondents were um, based in England. And in the past year in England, um, tuition fees for higher education have risen considerably, making higher education prohibitively expensive for some people. And while the EU has some of the lowest fees in the sector, even so, it's likely that in the context of fee rises, many people will be particularly risk averse. And so the opportunity to have a taster of paid for content via OpenLearn could be especially appealing for them. Thanks. And uh, with my 18 year old son starting university uh, today, um, <laughs> I'm very well aware of the fees issue in this country. Um, but uh, I think actually really interesting to contrast with or compare with the iTunes use. So I suppose, again, sort of uh, my, my position, I suppose, that um, something that's really got uh, is an open education resource um, might mean that we expect to see a bit less of feed through from iTunes to um, YouTube. Um, but what does the data actually say, Katrina? 
Well, I've put some data here for you to see on the left-hand side of the slide to show where users are going next after visiting the open content on ours and third-party platforms. There's a significant difference, and I think because we've been understanding more about the demographic, we can explain this. So in terms of click-through rates to our student inquirer website study at the OU, the OU benefits the least from iTunes U users. So when we're thinking about our business models, at least, we can see that whilst we have many millions of visitors, um, very, very few of them are coming through to make an inquiry. This is probably due to their non-UK location and the perception that the OU is for British students, potentially. However, OpenLearn shows the most impressive click-through to inquirers um, at around 10%. Uh, the quotes you can see on the right-hand side are both from iTunes U users. The, I just added these in because they really came out, jumped out um, for me. The first one is basically someone saying, look, I've tended to use these free modules as tasters to help me decide on more formal distance learning courses. So that's an iTunes U user who's just having a look at subject matter, doesn't really care which, the, what the provider is. That's a good thing, potentially. Um, and the second quote jumped out at me because we do have this uh, considerable international audience for our iTunes U content. And if we just, re I'll just read this one back to you. Being in Iran, all the doors are closed to us. Open University, as the name very correctly applies, opens a door to us and helps us bypass the censorship of government. At least three other of my friends are using iTunes U. So I felt that was a, a good reminder that not everyone using the platform is in a privileged position to have perhaps been so well educated and having options and choices to move on with what they study. Okay, thanks so much. And uh, I think it's, it's really interesting to get these different perspectives from the different sites. And the, in a sense, what you're talking about at the moment is, um, is sort of the way it's of value to us as the Open University. And um, I think your other point that you made was about uh, sort of the bridge, bridge in to, to formal learning. And so what is it people are actually gaining from using the OER content? Um, perhaps we'll go back to Leanne on that one. Thanks, Patrick. Um, the third aspect um, that I, I had said earlier that I was going to talk about was the development of study skills and slightly more generic um, skills. And this is something that the learners themselves are actually gaining. And also, we can see it can be of benefit to um, educational institutions as well. So there are dual benefits here. Um, Firstly, um, it's worth noting that the, the evidence that we got relating to um, study skills, attitudes towards um, learning, both informal and formal, apply to both formal students and informal learners completing the Open Learn survey. And it's actually worth noting also that 49% of informal learners and 58% of formal students said that their motivation to use Open Learn was to improve their study skills. So I think that's a quite a clear sphere that sometimes the focus is not on specific um, course content, but on more generic skills that can be preparation for or enhancement of the study. Um, so formal students using OpenLearn were asked, then asked a set of questions that um, considered the possible impact of OpenLearn on their formal studies. And I'm uh, just picking out a few pertinent examples that I have um, represented in this, this graph. And we're looking at the, um, the red bars um, to, to start with. Um, Firstly, focusing on meta-level study related traits such as confidence and independence, they were um, covered by the questions. And as the, the graph shows, 39% of former students indicated that using open learn had led to their gaining confidence, and 30 and um, oh, that, that's 37%. I'm getting it. And 39% that they had gained um, independence and self-reliance from um, studying with open learn. And a related consideration here, 42% of respondents indicated their use of OpenLearn resulted in their increased experimentation with new ways of learning. So you can see how that would um, not only translate into the um, informal use of the OpenLearn resources, but also into a formal study context. And each of these findings adds to a picture of OpenLearn and informal study of OER more generally being complementary with formal education. 
and that these students who develop generic study skills and qualities may be more likely perhaps to perform well in their formal studies and also less likely to withdraw from a module. Um, and it's worth noting that withdrawal and ret retention is a big concern in UK higher education, I think sort of around the globe. And it's a priority area for HE funders in the UK especially. And indeed, the Open Learn using formal students were actually explicitly asked whether they felt they were more likely to complete their current course of study as a result of studying Open Learn. And 29% of survey respondents indicated this was the case. So that's you know, not an inconsiderable number, really. And also related to student retention, the results indicated that studying with open learning resources leads to increased enthusiasm for future study. And so we're talking really about progression here. And 55% of respondents suggested this was the case. So that has benefits for the individual and also for institutions. It's worth noting with the, um, with the final bar on this, of this graph that students were more reticent about seeing a link between open learn use and improved grades and only 14% indicated that this might apply to them. The second set of bars I've just included because it's an interesting comparison that we'd asked open learn using educators for their views on the impact of open learn and OER more generally on formal students and it's interesting that, that pretty much across the board with a couple of just a couple of exceptions, but generally they are more positive than the students about impact, especially the first three um, elements and the grades improving. The educators, 46%, suggested that they thought that students' grades would improve. Yeah, and uh, that sort of sparks a little bit of uh, discussion um, in, in the chat as well, and uh, also amongst us, I think the because we've done some other surveys and uh, I'd say the, the optimism of educators comes across a bit in terms of, of improving grades. So uh, it's a bit hard to say who's right and who's wrong in this, but it, it is notable that educators are thinking that the use of OER is likely to lead to improvement of grades more than the learners themselves. And there's the other one that sort of goes slightly the way, and it's really very slight, is, is the increased enthusiasm for future study. That, um, and I think actually it's going to be re it's really hard to uh, say which is the more important thing to increase enthusiasm, increase the way in which people might stay in the system versus actually getting higher grades. And perhaps there's been too much worrying about the higher grades and less about the retention aspect. Um, but of course, we, we've doing this comparison throughout between Open Learn and iTunes U and, um, and YouTube. So I'm going to hand over to Petrina and ask Petrina to sort of update us on what the data tells us for iTunes U and YouTube. Thank you. What I did um, for this comparison, I, I looked at the question in the survey that asked people what they had done with the content that they had viewed or downloaded. And we can see from this slide that um, incredibly, looking at the cluster of bars on the far left, we can see that over 80% of iTunes U users and slightly less of OpenLearn users have used the OU content in a piece of work or academic essay. I mean, that's that I found that to be, when I saw that, I said, goodness me, compared to sort of around about 5% for YouTube. So these are people for iTunes U, they're, they're educated, they're, the minority of them are, are still studying, but on the whole, they're, they're using it as a real mine of information. When it comes to sharing, YouTube, not surprisingly, scores highest, given the ease with which you can share a video. Now, bear in mind as well that on the OpenLearn platform, it is possible to download a number of our course units in alternative formats, so people can be sharing that content, but we wouldn't know. Um, you can download a Word or a PDF of a lot of the course units that are available as um, Creative Commons licensed content. But yes, yeah, so you can share a YouTube video very easily. So if you just take a minute to look, to look at the implications of that. Interestingly, a lot of people have said, oh, I haven't used it yet. Potentially because you download something, you might save it for later. Um, the quotes on the right are from iTunes U users. The first one was from someone who declared themselves as an educator, actually. And I, put, I know we're talking about journeys from informal to formal learning. But I thought it was useful to put this one in because it was illustrative of what a lot of people were saying. They were making it clear that they aren't using entire courses for teaching. In fact, many said that they just use it as a mechanism for inspiration for their lesson planning. 
The second quote was interesting because, again, it was reflective of a number of uh, comments that we received in, in the study, um, was that it implies that the users see iTunes U as the content platform and they pay little attention to the providers themselves. And I know from my experience that I'll search on a subject and not a university, and given that there's 600 educational institutions now using iTunes U, this isn't really surprising behaviour. So this group are seeing the, the platform as a, a source of information. They go in, they take what they need, and they go, it, the, the, the provider is not important to them. And I can see there's been a lot of chat about um, people knowing or having an appreciation for the licence. And I would say that the, the data also showed, which will probably be the uh, subject of another webinar, perhaps, and certainly of a number of blogs, that um, generally, on the whole, people aren't actually aware or interested um, in the in the license um, of the content. And those who have expressed um, a concern about it are in the considerable minority, but we can talk about that another time. Thank you very much. So um, I just uh, want to drag up uh, sort of what's, what's coming next for us. But then we're going to revisit all of those questions that have come up along the way. Uh, so uh, I think we will have a few more comments to say about the, the licensing side in, in, in dealing with questions. Um, so we, this is uh, we are sort of moving on. We've been we've been we've got a year into our work, works. We've got lots of interesting things coming through from surveys and um, um, just sort of saying that some of the suggestions for questions that we might ask. As well, this, these are not all of the questions being analysed. These are ones that are particularly. particularly looking at the informal and formal learning experience. So we have got some questions in, around reuse and so forth to be able to report. And we've got uh, various conferences where we'll be talking about these things, EADTU in Paris, Open Ed that's in Utah, and PCF7 in um, Nigeria, uh, uh, and more. So this, do come and talk to us if you're going to be at those events. And we're going to be running more of these webinars now that we've started on them. Uh, yeah, of course, three different continents. Uh, oh, um, yes, I'm going to drop in on Indonesia to, 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 to pick off Asia along the way. Um, uh, so we're going to do OER and policy, uh, so the policy aspect, uh, and then sort of broader one and sort of OER, uh, whether they answer the challenges in, in the Indian education system, sort of looking at, a, at the needs there are in, in that system. And uh, Leanne, who's been speaking today, has been doing work in India. Uh, and we really want to know uh, things. We've got this evidence-based approach, which can take in all sorts of different elements of evidence, hard evidence, uh, the grades. We've got some information there, but also um, the things that back up your opinions about what is important. So do do feed that in to us in various ways. So um, okay. So now we're going to switch to the questions, and uh, I'd like to uh, so. Do ask fresh questions into the chat. I'm going to sort of pick up on ones that I know have come up. And there was a, a whole cluster uh, near the beginning about whether we're looking at this, I suppose, in the right way. We're, we're looking at the feed from informal into formal. Should we really be tackling this, this in the other way? Sort of how is formal learning able to take advantage of the OER? How do you fit OER into formal learning? How can formal go across into um, uh, into the informal area? Uh, so I'm going to pass that to uh, Leanne in the first instance. So Leanne, do you want to respond to that question? How can formal flow to informal through OER? How can formal flow to informal? OK. Um, I do see it as a two-way relationship, and it's quite um, possible. I'm just returning to OpenLearn here, where the op Open University does use um, informal um, learning experiences, and DRR and OpenLearn as a test bed to develop new um, pedagogies, new um, teaching and learning experiences, new tools that are then fed back in to formal um, formal learning, you know, it's paid for provision, and vice versa. So there's quite 
uh, a dynamic relationship between the two in, in that respect. But obviously that does also depend on being able to be on top of the, um, the user experience. So I think research like this is, is, is quite important in seeing what works and what doesn't work and so that, that any development can be research informed. Right. Thanks, Leanne. And uh, so, Katrina, I'm going to sort of direct you perhaps to, to talk a little bit about uh, the experience I know you've got that you haven't completely presented here to do with the work with Bridge success and um, uh, because Alana asked a, uh, a question that sort of links into this about whether what we're finding is, is too OU specific in a way, or OU is more online ed, distance ed, uh, and can the same findings bridge across into the more traditional classroom-based ed or the challenges for people like the community colleges. So perhaps comparing what I know you know from working in the community college area with what you're finding in the uh, iTunes U open learning research, um, do you see that there is a, a crossover into the classroom-based education? Yes, I was itching to say something about the Bridge to Success project. Um, I, I do. I do think it does cross over. And the Bridge to Success project that was funded by the Gates Foundation, which finished a couple of years ago or 18 months ago or so, demonstrated that because we created OER for the, our sister website, if you like, the Open Learn Works or formerly LabSet Space platform, where we tailored Open University um, content that was really aimed at community college students to build their confidence in maths and in learning to study skills. And that content, some of it was standalone for students to use, they were guided to it, and, and, but the majority of that content was delivered in the classroom setting. So students were guided through the OER by a tutor and um, the results were very pleasing and um, were really quite exemplar in, with respect to how you can manage your OER. So we, we decided to embellish the content as much as we could with confidence building activities so that if you were using it and if you had stumbled upon it in fact independently you could use it almost as well as if you had someone there with you in the classroom helping you through it but I, I can't stress enough how pleased we were with the results and how that model was then replicated beyond the life of the project. I just want to also go back to the comment about uh, you, you asked Leanne to respond to with respect to how can informal lead to formal and I think that the approach that the OU is trying to take with OpenLearn is it's really trying to go for the confidence building angle. So we see a lot of the MOOCs aiming pretty high with their um, expectations of students' educational abilities before they start a course, for example. I know we should, don't want to raise the spectre of MOOCs, but, but really from the OU's perspective, a lot of it's about aiming the content at the right level and really getting people to think about their own confidence and their skills as learners so that when they do go on, if they do go on to become formal students, we've managed their expectations as to what it would be like to study with us or elsewhere, the time you have to put in, um, understanding about assessment as well and understanding what your strengths are. And obviously the big thing missing from that equation is how to support these people because we just, we can't, we, we sort of set them free with all this open content and the challenge for us in the future is how we best build in peer support mechanisms perhaps, um, use the, the kind of the social, online social world to, to help with that, to facilitate that in the, in the absence of being able to fund obviously vast um, amounts of social support that we would we would put in place ourselves and also looking at the way we might utilize badges and other forms of online assessment to really facilitate that confidence building. Um, would this perhaps put people off um, taking an OU course? Maybe, but maybe those are the people who wouldn't make it to the end of their qualification. And as we know now in higher education in the UK, it's all about getting that qualification. Yeah, so I mean, the way in which you've got different audiences, I think, um, I you mentioned this in, in talking about some of your stats that uh, there's a really um, high number of, uh, high proportion of students who say that they've got a disability. Uh, and uh, uh, I know from talking to you both that uh, uh, that's roughly double the, the proportion who you'd expect to find studying in formal education. So, uh, I mean, do you think that um, you know more of demographics in the background of this. Do you feel that we've got a, 
an audience that's not being catered for very well by formal education who are ending up uh, doing these inf more informal education through OER. Yes, um, I, I could talk about the data all day. Um, I, I do get people locked into rooms with me and they can't escape when we start talking about the, the depths of some of this data, but the, the disability fact, factor was really quite incredible. Um, we discovered for Openland that 19% of our users, as Leanne said, um, are registering themselves as disabled uh, for a variety of reasons. And the number of, I mean, that's higher than the percentage that we have as paid for students at the Open University. So the challenges that that presents us with is, OK, how accessible is our open content? Is it accessible as the content that we're expecting our students to pay for? And the answer to that is, on the whole, it is. But we do, we do have room for improvement. So we're addressing that considerably. We've shared the data about the disabled users, informal learners, with our widening participation unit to see what they can do with it as well. And also, we're thinking about targeted campaigns, understanding that we have as I say, almost a fifth of the people using the platform who are disabled. I think it possibly could be indicative of the sad fact that a lot of people who are disabled are in the um, low income category. And we did see from some of the comments that came out from the studies that a lot of people want to study with us. And whilst they might not necessarily be unemployed as such, they don't have a disposable income to spend on a university qualification. So. We've got a lot of work to do to unravel why we have this incredibly high number, we think, of people registering themselves as disabled using OER. Very pleasing from ticking the box from a widening participation perspective, but we really want to support these people more and start targeting um, our content more towards them and making sure we're absolutely watertight in its accessibility, because it's all very well making everything available in multiple formats, but we need to be absolutely sure that it's as accessible as it can be. Thanks, Katrina. And uh, sort of picking up on a, a question from Alana there, um, which is about how do we actually ensure that these research projects that we carry out um, can scale up um, and, as she puts it, go into open educational uh, practice as well as into the open educational resources. Um, and I think there's a whole sort of linked little discussion of, about the licensing behind that. Um, uh, uh, Clint puts it as students always always know and don't always appreciate the idea that uh, the lecturer says, buy my textbook. Uh, uh, will there come a point where people do appreciate the idea that they say, use this free resource? And um, but how does that play with the educators, I suppose? So sort of turning that into something that your data might help. Um, you were presenting the learner view on the whole here. But have you got any sort of things you'd highlight from educator feedback about uh, how they're using it in the class and and the attitudes that there are to OER amongst the educator community, either from what you've surveyed or from what you know about uh, from the other elements of your research? Um, so uh, i leave it to you to choose who answers that. It's Leanne. And here I'll um, make a start on answering that. We did, as you said, survey educators uh, about their attitude to OER and also their their use of of OER, and got a, a, quite an interesting um, say tension, but an interesting contrast between the fact that of the uh, participants, there wasn't a great awareness about open licensing for a start. So um, this is amongst uh, respondents generally, only 13% said that resource having an open license allowing adaptation was an important factor when they selected it, and 15% that having a Creative Commons license was important. Yet, a high number of um, survey respondents, and especially educators, said that they were adapting um, resources. And I think, I haven't got the statistics right in front of me, I think about 80, 80 to 100 people said that they were adapting and remixing resources. Now, it could be that their perception of adapting resource may not be quite what we see as, as uh, adaption in adaptation in terms of um, sort of fully fledged OER. It could be that that meant that they were putting them into a, a, a 
module of their own and perhaps changing the names a bit, but it's certainly indicative that there is um, some remixing and adapting going on. Um, also, educators, we have data on whether their overall attitudes to sharing had changed. And I think this picks up on some of the things that have been um, addressed in the, all right, just pick up on Plint's question. The 88% the was across the board. I can get up, in a minute I'll get up the stats for faculty. Um, it, it was um, pretty high for faculty in terms of adapting. But again, I'm not sure what sort of adapting we're talking about. But yes, um, just going back to what I was saying about sharing, that um, one of the educators said that, in fact, their sharing practice hadn't really changed as a result of using OER in that they shared quite a lot beforehand. And I think that, that highlights the fact that they may not necessarily be making a distinction between OER and just free online content in, in that respect. So um, and we have, did ask, we asked educators about the impact on their practice as well. And that's, that's another whole new webinar. And I imagine at some point in the future we will do an educators webinar. Okay, so uh, we're coming close to our end, but uh, I do feel that uh, as we're, we're, we're etching towards it, um, perhaps we will sort of talk about that open aspect in particular. So uh, we've, we've got a lovely discussion going on about this ad adaptation, and it's very interesting the numbers that you get. I think adaptation turns out to be something that you can measure in different ways, and uh, um, uh, I know because I was quoted uh, in the past as an example of someone who said adaptation didn't happen when I didn't say that. I just said that the complete cycle of putting things back out was fairly rare, um, whereas adaptation in use is coming up again. So do you feel from what you're getting that uh, uh, the point that uh, Jane was making sort of does adaptation happen more with open resources? In other words, because we specifically say you can do it or as a teacher, are you too busy to actually worry about these things and perhaps take some risks with uh, commercial material that shouldn't be adapted in this way? Um, so any any signs of that coming through? I know it's, it's perhaps mainly for another seminar, but uh, uh, Petrina and Leanne sort of on the uh, educator side again. Um, at the moment, we've really been focusing on analysing the the student data and sort of moving on with the educate, educated data next. So um, I think it's a bit early to say at this stage whether that's, that's coming through from the data. Um, so I think, yeah, at this stage, a, bit, a little bit early to say. Patrick, um, 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 Katrina is also shaking her head here that, that at the moment that data hasn't come um, been analysed yet for um, iTunes U either. I'm just popping in here. I don't know if um, Patrick was thinking that if he's speaking, I'm not sure, but I just found these um, statistics for educators remixing of OER, and that was 89%, so it was 88% for uh, former students and 89% um, for educators, indicating that they're adapting remixing OER. Um, Thanks, Leanne. That's great. So I'll just, just uh, draw it a close with the microphone on this time. Um, so I was just mentioning that we had hoped that uh, Beck Pitt would be with us as well. So uh, she's not well today. So uh, apologies uh, on her behalf. Um, uh, she's also been working in the informal sector and uh, uh, looking at British success and uh, working also with the uh, School of Open and Jane. So thank you very much. Uh, you gave us some interesting questions, some interesting leads as well to follow up on. Um, we will be running more of these webinars. Um, uh, they're quite good fun, actually. And uh, 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 we have got lots more to share. 
So thank you very much for your interest and goodbye for now. Goodbye.